Okay, uh, we can get started for the next session. If everyone could just take their seats. Our next session is looking at how do First Nations people in New Zealand and Canada fit into the legal structures and governance of their countries. And our first uh, speaker is Tariana Turia, former member of Parliament, New Zealand. to the Anu University. Thank you so much for inviting me to come over for this hui. I want to acknowledge Matilda um, and to thank her for allowing us to be amongst her tribal peoples on their land. Also want to take the opportunity to Mihi Talinda Burney, to Ken Wyatt, and to Senator Patrick Dodson, Tena Koto. I am tribally of Ngā Wairiki Ngāti Upper, Ngā Rauru, Wanganui, and Ngāti Tuwhare Toa. On the 12th of October 1996, I was elected into the New Zealand Parliament. I went on to serve in six su successive terms, occupying a diverse variety of roles. I was a list MP for the Labour Party, a minister in the Labour government, an independent MP and the co-leader of the Māori Party for 10 years as an electorate representative from 1999 to 2014. And from 2008, a minister in the Māori Party National Party Coalition government. I served on select committees in Māori affairs, primary production, transport and industrial relations, health and regulations review. I sat on the Standing Orders, Officers of Parliament and Privileges Committee. One might say in my 18 years of office that I had a unique opportunity from which to respond to the question, how do First Nations people in New Zealand fit into the legal structures and governance of their country? In my maiden speech to Parliament, I shared my apprehension about what a political journey might consist of. I said, for every negotiation we enter into, we have to doubly justify ourselves, perform twice as well as others, and open our books to minute scrutiny. Everything we do must turn to magic the first time round. We cannot do worse than what has already been done. It is our right and our responsibility to take control of our own affairs. Only we can truly restore our dignity and integrity. We know the problem, then let us be our own solution. Over two decades later, as I look back at my political prophecy, I can't help but think of Albert Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. It was this, his view that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. And so as I think about the nature of legal structures and governance, I wonder was the rejection of the independent indigenous voice in 2014, I'm sorry, 2018, an inevitable reflection that 178 years post-colonisation, we still have some way to go to living up to the legacy of our founding document to Treaty or Waitangi. Our ancestors signed up to key, two key documents of governance in 1835 and 1840. Hewaka Pūtanga o Te Rangatiratanga o New Tirane was signed on the 28th of October 1835. In that document, Ngāi We Māori declared ourselves a sovereign nation, suggesting that the United Tribes of New Zealand would meet at Waitangi each autumn to frame laws to govern our country. Five years later, Te Treaty or Waitangi was signed across our nation as a means of consolidating strategic leadership, political debate and alliances. Both these covenants of faith gave birth to the nation of, notion of partnership, which would give value to the histories and the cultures, the values and knowledges of both the First Nation people, Tangata Whenua, and those that came to Aotearoa by virtue of these two documents, Ngā Tangata Treaty. Central to these constitutional references was the notion of rangatiratanga, 
self-determination for Māori as we might see expressed in the rights defined by our association to our mountains, our rivers, our seas and our marae, and to our tūpuna, our elders and our gods, our lands, our environment, our ancestors, our gods. Despite this framework for nationhood, on the 13th of September 2007, when 144 other nations of the world signed up to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Labour government, the same government that is in power today, opposed the declaration on the basis of Article 3, the right to self-determination. Exactly 10 years later, that same Labour government was voted back into government and the only Indigenous political party that has ever served in a New Zealand government lost its seats, and therefore its opportunity to continue to stand in the House of so-called representatives. So this Anu Forum is a fascinating juncture by which to look back over the last two decades and ask ourselves the critical question, was fitting into the legal structures and governance of our nation that caused our demise? Another important milestone last year was that 2017 marked 150 years since the New Zealand Parliament signed up to the Māori Representation Act of 1867. The absence of commentary or recognition by the media in academic arenas or in Parliament itself was deeply concerning. It is not as if our endemic problems have disappeared and we no longer have any need for Indigenous insights to resolve contemporary issues. The Ministry of Justice figures showed 56.3% of people imprisoned last year were Māori, the highest proportion since records were made available from 1980. And record numbers of Māori children comprised the 6,300 children in the care of the state. Two out of three ch children in care are Māori. I want to return to this notion of fitting in and use it to describe one of the most effective policy achievements that resulted from having an Indigenous voice in Parliament. The concept of fitting in implies with it a willingness to conform, to resemble the status quo, to match the prevailing view. One of the greatest challenges of our experience as Indigenous politicians is the difference between political participation and political representation. Last century, for those first Māori MPs in the House, participation was a major challenge. There was the language barrier for a start. Māori politicians faced a hard road in taking government policy out to their people for bills and other parliamentary papers affecting Māori were seldom translated into te reo Māori. Individual Māori MPs were often seen as a minority. The political party to which they swore allegiance was established to represent mainstream New Zealand rather than the interests of Māori as the treaty partner. This dilemma between participation and representation, I believe, remains one of the greatest challenges for Māori in government right up to the current day. To combat the domination of the majority rule over the decades, Māori political parties came into being. In 1981, Manamutu Hake gained 15% of the Māori vote. From 1993 to 2003, the Mana Māori movement represented Māori interests, incorporating two other political parties, the Piriwiri Tua movement, which was based around the Ratana movement, which is a church movement, and Te Tawhiro, which is founded on the Ringatū church principles. Other parties around this time were Māori Pacific, which was the spirit of the Pacific, Mana Wahine Te Ira Tangata, and more recently, the Mana Party. And then in 2004, in response to thousands of New Zealanders protesting against the foreshore and seabed bill, the Māori Party mobilised popular support and in 2005 gained four of the Māori electorate seats. Three years later, it was invited into government, where it stayed for three successive terms from 2008 to 2014, in partnership with late, our national, sorry. And so I come back to the question, is it better to fit in or to retain political independence? Over our 13 years in Parliament, the Māori Party was often asked if we would accept the baubles of power. Our answer was informed by the wisdom of our founding president, 
Matu of Watarangi Winniata. His advice was that our people didn't vote us into Parliament to sit in opposition to sit in the back benches. We had a responsibility and an obligation to both hold government to account while also striving to achieve as much as possible for our whānau, hapu and iwi. And so the political configuration that worked best for us was a coalition, coalition agreement by which we sat outside of cabinet, cabinet but with ministerial roles and resources. It gave us the wonderful opportunity to introduce the policy revolution I referred to before called Whānau Ora. Whānau Ora is based on the concept that strengthening Whānau capability, working directly with our fam families, focusing on intergenerational transfer of knowledge, being driven by outcomes and strengths-based, all of these factors would create the conditions by which our own influence and integrity was brought to bear. In 2010, $138 million was allocated to Whānau Ora and I was appointed the Minister. We had our own appropriation. We knew well that the traditional contractual approach of government separated families into individuals, focusing on a single problem rather than a coordinated, integrated and holistic approach. In short, our common experience was that Wano support was shaped by funder priorities rather than the actual family needs. Moreover, the focus was largely on crisis management, with less emphasis on positive development and enabling the aspirations of Wano to be realised. We were treated as sad, bad and mad. Health was about disease focus. Policy developments were often characterised as a helicopter drop, which led to fragmented and frustrated communities. We knew that we could do better. Whānau Ora recognises a group capacity for self-determination. It has an intergenerational dynamic. It is built on a Māori cultural foundation and it can be applied across a wide range of social and economic sectors. We wanted government to improve its approach, to build and foster relationships, to focus on family rather than the service and to give priority to early investment which in turn enabled Whānau to be more independent. It is as far away from fitting in as one could imagine. What we knew works is flexibility to tailor our approach to local circumstances, to create, strengthen and maintain the capability of Wano as the key lever for catalysing change. The passion and the commitment of Wano to improving their own outcomes has been absolutely inspirational. The time and investment they put into their initiative is significant. They have grasped the opportunity to be self-determining. Their preference is clear that they would rather be opening up pathways to aspiration than backpedalling in cycles of deprivation. Whānau Ora navigators walk alongside of Whānau in building capacity. Collaboration is integral to the success that they seek. What we have learned is that you cannot outsource wellbeing. The ancient connections to land and place to people and story is vital to the success of Wano Order. Change cannot occur by simply having Māori people participate or Māori words and concepts being applied in policy. The model has to emerge out of the relationships, histories and values that reflect a different system than the Westminster system of Parliament. Wano Order has been phenomenally successful precisely because it challenges conventional systems. It puts Wano back in the driving seat of their own destiny. It is based on a world view where the outcomes, the approach and the delivery is designed, owned and controlled by First Nation peoples rather than being tacked on to the mainstream approach. Without First Nations political advocacy, however, any policy transformations designed and driven by Māori will always be vulnerable. The new government was barely six months old before, in its first budget, it made no new provision for Whānau Order, thereby restricting the impact of its reach and coverage to the maintenance of the status quo. And this is the crux of the matter. Success in policy design and delivery will be best for Māori when owned by and controlled by Māori at the helm. Likewise, political impact can only be realised when Māori political presence 
is not just about participation, but far more powerfully is about representation. Despite lauding the fact that the 2017 Parliament had more Māori pol politicians than any other Parliament prior, the Labour government reneged on its campaign promise to boost Wano order funding and slashed another nine million off the Māori Affairs Agency to Puni Kōkiri with, for, for this year with a further 12 million to be sliced off over the next four years. Widespread disappointment was registered across Māori communities who called the budget a kick in the guts for Māori and a budget of broken promises. Finally, I want to leave with the challenge that being Māori by wakapapa or genealogy is one thing. Being Māori by kaupapa or philosophy is where the change is ultimately required. We have Māori MPs in Parliament now who identify as Māori, but will not promote or uphold the values and aspirations which we hold dear to and which are advanced by our people. Those MPs will fit into the legal structures. They will fit into Parliament, but their impact will always be limited unless they can also support and progress Māori principles and practices. We have a saying, me hoki waka muri, ki ahu waka mua, look back to guide the way forward. If we are ever going to fulfil the legacy of our ancestors who signed the Treaty of Waitangi, it will not occur through fitting in. We need to be representatives, advocates, champions for change and for the cause, to sing our songs, to use our language, to walk our talk. I have great faith in, in those who uh, have come back into the Māori Party to rebuild. Our current priority is not on fitting in, but fit out. To rebuild the connections we have across Aotearoa with Wano, Hapu and Iwi as our base. We live by a protocol that is influenced by marae tikanga. In other words, every member of our movement is valued equally. Unity is important, each of us living up to the legacy that we were born into. In doing so, we are committed to a model of building consensus that gives effect to the spirit and intent of Te Tiriti or Waitangi, one which encourages us all to live the treaty partner rather than simply to confine, confine it to the archives of political history. Our greatest strength is ourselves. Ko tō reo me ona tikanga. I thank you for the honour and privilege of sharing our story with you, and my greatest hope for these few days is that we can learn together how to capitalise on our kinship ties, to demonstrate our respect for one another, and to emphasise our common unity as peoples of the land, First Nations, families of the world. Tēnā tātou katoa. Thank you, Tariana. Uh, our next speaker is Maria Barge, Head of School, Māori Studies, Victoria University of Wellington. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, tēnā koe Matilda, kei hea koe. Uh, nā ui whakatau mai i a tātou katoa, uh, ki te iwi ngana hoki, uh, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Uh, ki ngā kai whakahaere, Mick Dodson, Esme Wood, uh, Brian Schmidt, Graham, uh, Gareth Evans, uh, ngā kai kōrero, uh, huri noa ki a tātou katoa, tēnā rā koutou. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for having me and for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to speak um, really about five practical ways in which Māori fit into legal and, and governance structures in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But I wanted to make um, two notes really before I start, and some of them are in a similar vein to some of the questions and discussion that's, that's come so far. First of all, the question that we've been posed suggests that we talk about how Māori fit into uh, New Zealand legal and governance structures. We could also be asking how non-Māori or non-Indigenous Australians fit into our legal and governance structures, um, and then we'd be having quite a different discussion. And I say that not just because of the semantics of the words, but I do think we need to remain critical of the kinds of assumptions um, that we're making in some of these um, discussions. Uh, having said that, I also wanted to note the specific position uh, from which Māori engage um, with the Crown and Aotearoa. 
um, Māori do continue to have our own uh, governance and legal structures. Um, they're clearly different to the ones that existed in the 1600s or the 1700s, um, but they continue and they practice Māori law, te kanga Māori, um, and perpetuate and continue Māori economic values. Um, and those are our runanga uh, structures, our, our tribal governance authorities. Um, so the largest of these are around 125,000 members, um, and the smallest really are in the range of 15 to 19,000 uh, members. We also also have national entities like the um, Iwi Chairs Forum, which doesn't have specific legal standing as such, but does engage directly with ministers of the Crown and has members on a number of working groups, policy working groups um, throughout government on significant issues for us, such as water ownership um, and allocation. Um, so that's the kind of context. We also have tribal economic entities um, which are based on Māori land and governed under the Māori Land Act. Um, and they're really the powerhouse of our Māori economy, but also continue to be driven by uh, Māori values and Māori law primarily. So having said uh, uh, that and setting out our, our context, um, I'll come back to what I assumed the question was uh, directing us to in, to in terms of the ways in which we fit in. So uh, despite the short time that we have, I'm going to try and squeeze in five quite practical ways um, that we fit into legal and governance structures. And the first one is around um, the Treaty of Waitangi, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, um, of course passed in eight, well, signed in 1840, um, allowed the British to govern and create a government in New Zealand at that time, but also guaranteed us Tinoranga Tiritanga, uh, the full and exclusive rights to our lands, homes uh, and treasures. It also provided Māori with rights um, of British subjects at that time. So I'm going to talk through, after each of these um, five kind of ways we fit in, about their strengths and weaknesses. So you may be aware of some of these mechanisms, but I think it's the strengths and weaknesses that I'd like to draw your attention to. So the treaty, of course, is excellent to have. That's its strength, P political leverage that we can derive um, from it, and it has led um, the Crown to trying to fulfil some of their treaty obligations by setting up a treaty settlements process. Um, we can no longer talk about historical um, breaches of the Treaty of Waitangi because they also created a deadline um, for those, um, but contemporary, urgent um, and other matters can continue to be heard um, by the Office of Treaty Settlements and through that mechanism. One of the weaknesses, I guess, of the Treaty of Waitangi is that successive governments have not managed to translate it uh, into an actual acknowledgement and an entrenched protection um, within our, our legal system um, for Māori rights. Some Prime Ministers have re refused to accept that Māori did not cede um, sovereignty. The second um, mechanism I wanted to talk about, and Tariana's mentioned this, is are our Māori seats, our Māori electorates um, for Māori representation. So they were established in 1867, and the rationale for their establishment really differs from the reason why we continue to have them. Um, and when we changed electoral systems in 1993, um, there were many comments made at that time about these seats actually being a minimum uh, recognition for Māori rights in our current constitutional arrangements. Um, but that's, of course, not quite why they were set up in the 18, in 1800s. There, there are seven Māori electorates out of a usual uh, size of house, house of Representatives of 120, and as, as Tariana suggested, the Māori electorates, the Māori seats and those representatives must not be confused with the Māori people who sit in the House of Representatives. After the, the last election, we had around 26 uh, Māori serving uh, in the House. But again, a lot's been made of that, um, including by many of those politicians, um, but not all of them. In fact, only seven of them are there as specific Māori representatives. Um, so in terms of strengths, well, it is good to have some uh, Māori representation. Uh, that's great, but the weaknesses um, are quite a few. The Māori electorates um, continue to be dominated by one political party, um, the Labour Party in New Zealand, and for many that makes them uh, appear to be safe seats and often they're then taken for granted by that particular political party. Um, we need to make them more marginal seats um, to sort of raise their profile and, and heat up the, the contest in those uh, electorates. 
the seats aren't entrenched. So 50% um, plus one of parliament could abolish those seats at any time. And there are a number of political parties that have that as a policy platform which is why they also don't stand candidates in those electorates um, because they fundamentally disagree with them or, or label them as uh, separatism. Uh, another weakness is that Māori can choose to go on the Māori electoral roll when you sign up and enrol um, and thereafter only once every five years. So you're pretty restricted in which role you're on. At this, this very moment, we have the Māori electoral option open. So at this present time, Māori can choose um, whether to be on the Māori electoral roll or the general electoral roll. Um, and the preliminary results um, from this particular option suggest that uh, certainly the new enrolments continue to go directly onto the Māori electoral roll, but we have quite significant numbers of Māori swapping uh, from the Māori roll to the general electoral roll. If that continues, unfortunately, there is a chance that we could lose one of those seats. Um, having said that, there's still time for Māori to swap from the general role to the Māori electoral role, and I would certainly encourage um, any that are out there or listening um, to do that. Um, we don't know the exact reasons for that. We have some anecdotal evidence, um, but we probably don't have um, enough time to get into that um, all here today. So that's at our national level. Um, the third way we're involved in legal and governance structures I want to talk about is similar, but at a, a, a regional level. Uh, Māori can have wards, can have seats as well in our local councils, our regional councils across the country. So under our Local Electoral Act 2001, um, councils can establish uh, Māori wards and have Māori seats in their, in their areas. So this is an opportunity that's available to them. Uh, only two councils um, have this, have wards um, set up out of a number of 78 across the country. So again, the, it, we've got a strength here. We have the opportunity for Māori representation. Uh, the weakness is that it's very difficult to achieve. Um, two out of 78 so far. There are a couple of others um, in the pipeline. The legislation itself is discriminatory. Um, it allows for council decisions to be overturned uh, or put to a public poll of if 5% of electors in that particular area sign a petition, they can create a public poll. Um, and this year, in fact, we had five councils who'd all taken the opportunity to have Māori representation in their areas. They'd all voted for having Māori seats on their councils. All five of those decisions were put to a public poll and all five of them uh, resulted in uh, a change to that. that. Basically, they all rejected at the public poll stage having Māori seats. Um, and so that's quite uh, disheartening, but it's also a discriminatory um, element to the, um, the legislation which should be um, changed. So the fourth uh, mechanism that I wanted to talk about was the Waitangi Tribunal, and this will be familiar to many of you. Um, it was established in 1975 by the Treaty of Waitangi Act. It's a permanent statutory commission of inquiry. Um, here's cases brought by any Māori person uh, about possible breaches of the principles of the treaty uh, to it. And it examines, as I said, historical, um, although the deadline has passed for, for lodging those, contemporary and urgent claims. And it tends to be bogged down by the urgent claims as the government continues its recidivist ways and continues to breach um, the principles of the treaty. Uh, and it makes recommendations to government. So in terms of a strength, it is useful, clearly, to have a mechanism where you can take claims. And for Māori, for many Māori uh, communities, having those historical issues aired and heard um, and listened to by and researched um, is a really valuable um, experience. The weakness is it's really not fit for the purpose that Māori try and uh, force upon it. Um, it's really not fit uh, for being able to be that kind of ultimate check and balance on breaches of the treaty. Um, it's underfunded and it only makes recommendations, um, except in specific circumstances, uh, and the government tends to ignore those pretty routinely. Um, one of our most significant uh, cases there, Kuaotearoa uh, tēnei Y262, about Māori intellectual and cultural property rights, has been sitting, um, being considered by the government since 2011. So it's a relatively weak mechanism in that kind of regard. The final uh, way in which we're included in legal and governance structures, 
you might also consider to be a fairly weak mechanism, although we've had quite a, a lot of success with it. Um, and these are through treaty clauses in legislation. So in 1986, in our State-Owned Enterprises Act at that time, a particular clause was slipped in uh, at the relatively uh, late stage of, of the reading of the bill, and it said that nothing in this Act shall permit the Crown to act in a manner that is inconsistent with the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. And since that time, there have been various versions of that kind of clause, um, sh shall take into account the principles of, Wa of the Treaty, uh, shall give effect to the principles of the Treaty. There's some variation, uh, and over the years we've had uh, quite a number of those. And I should note um, our current uh, acting Prime Minister is also Māori, and he's put forward, his party's put forward at least t on two occasions, um, a bill to delete all of those principles um, of the Treaty of Waitangi out of all legislation. Um, so sometimes there are unexpected consequences of things. Um, in terms of strengths, well, um, it enables Māori some legal leverage having these clauses in there. We have a recourse to the courts um, to try and uh, enforce some of those. Um, in terms of weaknesses in practice, the Crown still uh, determines what they believe to be consistent with the principles of the treaty, and that's usually at the sort of lower end of the spectrum, um, but they can be quite influential uh, mechanisms. So those are briefly uh, five ways that we fit into the New Zealand legal and governance structures, and I look forward to questions um, and discussion. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Maria. Our next speaker is Brian Crane, Queen's Counsel, fellow for the Gowling WLG American College Trial Lawyers. Brian. Like other speakers, I want to pay uh, respects to uh, the First Nations on these lands and uh, to honor their ancestors and the past and the present and the future. The, I was also very moved by the ceremony that we had this morning uh, outside the old parliament uh, with a large uh, fire or with a smudge with, with a lot of uh, smoke and uh, I joined the others to participate in that in the washing of the body with the smoke and and then I came to the side of the circle and to watch and the smoke got in my eyes again and so I moved to another po place in the circle and the smoke followed me I could only conclude that I had a lot of cleansing to do <laughs> I propose to address the uh, the challenge of the topic and the shortness of the time by some general comments on three areas. First, the, the place of the Constitution in Canada and the recognition of Aboriginal and treaty rights in that Constitution. Second, the uh, engagement with the government or the governments because provincial governments as well as the federal government are involved in, in treaty making over the past 30 years. And uh, this is an area that I personally have spent a lot of professional time in, uh, especially in uh, northern Canada. And uh, lastly, to talk a bit about the role of the courts in that uh, in that process and the recognition in the courts of indigenous rights. And uh, finally, a few general remarks on whether there is any relevance to the Australian scene in this uh, story. 
the I, I would say that you don't get anywhere uh, without knowing a little bit about the country. And in Canada, we have had a, a long history of uh, uh, discrimination and uh, some conflicts, some, not many, Indian wars, uh, a large period of attempted assimilation of the Indian or native population uh, with uh, the European or settler communities and a rather reluctant coming into the modern age encouraged by some judicial decisions and encouraged also by a high level of political action by, the, by Native organizations in the 1970s. And then, so that all of this is sort of the setting for any discussion about uh, how Native people fit in to the governance of Canada. Let me just give you a, quick a few quick highlights of that story. The early settlers were English. There were wars. There were, there were the uh, invasions by the French. There was counter uh, action. There was eventually uh, a peace and in the, in the process, there was a rivalry with the United States and worry about the United States taking over Canada. And then there was a settlement of the, the West going from what is now Ontario to the Pacific Coast, opening up new lands, which had originally been opened up quite considerably by the fur traders and uh, the... Uh, the uh, companions, the courier de bois, that went with the fur traders uh, to the farthest reaches of the country and took f furs back to Montreal. And the opening of the great railway between the transcontinental railway, which became a political theme for expansion of the West. And the, 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 the government in power was always in favor of opening up the West and driving the railway west. And finally, of course, the, uh, the settlement of the, of the country, and British Columbia joining in, and then the provinces coming together in 1867, a gigantic union of the existing provincial governments or colonies with uh, Canada to become the Canadian Federation. So the history really starts as a country from a federal point of view with 1867 and the British Parliament passed an act called the British North America Act which has a lot of pieces in it about setting up legisl legislatures and the judiciary and dealing with uh, uh, the electoral process and, and amending the statute. There's no mention there of uh, any uh, social policies. There's no mention of Aboriginal people or anything of that sort in that document. What it has remained, though, as is a charter for the division of powers between the central government and the, and the um, provinces. And so one of the sections of that statute was gave the power to regulate lands and lands reserved for the Indians to the uh, central government. But in fact, today, through the passage of time, the provinces, the provincial governments, equally have a legislative role <coughs> in relation to Native communities. So once that, that happened, there was a, the quickly was a passage of a statute called the Indian Act, which sets up uh, the uh, the uh, band system, the reserve system, 
the, the, uh, the process for managing the Indian population. Just give me, could I get that one? That, thanks. The process for managing the Indian population. And after that, the, the, the next item in the chronology that we look to um, is the, the um, situation where Indians are discriminated against in the Indian Act and in other legislation. No right to vote, disenfranchised, no right to retain legal counsel. Now, the very much under the hands of the Indian agent who, was con who controlled their affairs and all that sort of thing. So the, from that emerged a crippled native culture. Here I'm speaking of the First Nations, equally the Inuit in the north, and uh, the, we're, we're in a situation of, of complete uh, uh, disengagement because there was very little government support for any of their activities. And we had the horrors of the residential school system, which resulted in countless abuses, which are still being recorded today. We had the removal of populations, relocation. We had the Indian, the adoption system under which uh, Indian children were taken and removed from Indian communities. Even today, this, this is being litigated. There is an important class action now underway in Canada, which is called the 60s Scoop, in which government came in in the 60s and removed and placed under foster care a large percentage of the Indian, Indian children. And so we have, coupled with that, we have the loss of culture, loss of language, and uh, disintegration. It came to the point in the late 1960s. Uh, 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 it uh, came to the, uh, the point where there was a uh, considerable uh, uh, proactive Native movement in Canada. Uh, in, the, in the late uh, 1960s, going on through the 1970s and the 1980s, the Native Indian Brotherhood and other, or other organizations uh, and engaged in strong political action. At the same time, in the courts, in the Calder case, which was 1974, that case uh, went to the Supreme Court of Canada, overruling previous decisions. It was our Mabo case, if you like. At that time, the, in Calder, the uh, court ruled that there was such a thing as Aboriginal rights and title. And of course, it remained for another 20, 30, 40 years before that could be defined in any way uh, which was acceptable uh, to the courts. But in, in, that, in that important case, uh, government policy changed dramatically overnight. And uh, the government declared that it was prepared to sit down and negotiate. Up to this point, there had been, right across Canada, a series of treaties, starting with historical treaties in the West and leading to uh, a number of individual treaties in Ontario, uh, to a whole series of what we call the numbered treaties in Western Canada and Northern Canada, which dealt with particular nations. And, and which rule made allocations of reserve lands in return for giving up their Aboriginal title. And those, those treaties were in place throughout Canada, except for British Columbia and Northern Canada, Yukon, Northwest Territories, and the, what is now Nunavut. So government said they would negotiate these, uh, the unsettled areas. They would negotiate claims, and so the land claim business came into force. We had, we had a whole series of land claim agreements in northern Canada, uh, starting uh, in, uh, uh, with, uh, in the Yukon, in, uh, with the uh, northern uh, 
uh, Northwest Territories uh, with the Inuvialuit, and, and then with a series of com what we call comprehensive claims, because the agenda was everything. Not only land and compensation, but, uh, but rights with respect to subject matters and, and uh, negotiating support arrangements. So that, was the, that is pretty well the background. In, in, uh, we, in the eight, eight, 1982, uh, leading up to the, uh, 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 the major constitutional reform, there was a series of considerable series of legal actions in Canada against the federal government, against the then Trudeau government, and it, uh, there, out of all this came what was a, re a massive reform, and the Constitution Act 1982 was the end result. And in that Constitution Act was the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which sets out for all Canadians a, uh, a, a shopping list of, of civil rights which, for which they can go to court. Freedom of religion, freedom of association, uh, a host of criminal right, uh, rights for criminal proceedings, fair trial rights, and uh, equality rights as well. At the same time, because of pressure from the native organizations and individual political leaders who supported the action strongly, uh, Canada declared that there was such a thing as, as uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights. And Section 35 of the Constitution was enacted. That is separate from the Bill of Rights, uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights. And that is perhaps the most significant uh, legal development in Canada in the whole field because Section 35 states that the rights are recognized, the rights of the Aboriginal peoples defined as the uh, Indians, uh, the uh, Métis, and the, Inu and the uh, Inuit are the Aboriginal peoples. They are rights which have not which, it, which then exist, are, are preserved, recognized, and affirmed. And by that action, the courts were given a solid foundation for future constitutional development, for future uh, interpretation of treaties and Aboriginal claims. If that had not happened, the courts would not have been able and would not probably have had the courage to enact a whole series of legal decisions which have fostered a positive relationship toward resolving native land claims. That, uh, that uh, important development is undoubtedly something that has relevance for Australia today. Uh, of course, these things are very much driven by the society they, they, they uh, derive from. And uh, there was, at that time, a consensus in Canada that there should be such a declaration. The politicians took it in their minds that they could move forward and they could create another amendment to the Constitution, which was worked out at one of these constitutional conferences like they might have had in this building. And that was the constitutional meeting in, in Charlottetown, which resulted in a document called the Charlottetown Accord. One of the provisions of the Charlottetown Accord was a declaration that the native peoples have the right to self-government. That, under our procedure, had to go to a referendum. It went to a referendum and failed. There was the usual thing that happens in the political process. Sides are formed, yes, no, uh, camps uh, put up scenarios which are perhaps not envisaged by the original framers of the measure. And it was, uh, it was a, a, a puzzling and depressing defeat when that uh, constitutional amendment did not go through. As a result, politicians in Canada tired of the whole exercise of trying to reform the, or, or amend the Canadian Constitution. 
and it was, uh, they, they laid down tools and they embarked on other matters. But the opportunity and the consensus that had been reached on the, in, on the self-government file was such that they, were, they decided to move forward and deal with, so this was in 1995, they decided the government of the day said that they would recognize, as a policy matter, the right to self-govern. And they, they declared what was called the inherent right policy. Uh, that policy still exists, and it allows negotiations to proceed uh, on a self-government agenda, which can be a, a sectoral type of agreement dealing with education, or it could be a complete comprehensive self-government giving a particular community or a group of communities legal, uh, legal powers to pass legislation and manage a particular area. And that is, uh, it has many successes. It was, it was required by the government of the day that the comprehensive process for comprehensive land claims, which has resulted in a series of modern treaties, must deal with self-government. And so that has created a whole set of self-government ag agreements in Canada. It's, a, it's an agenda that is not supported uh, unanimously by any means among the native native communities because there are strong federal restrictions on what can be negotiated and what cannot be negotiated. But the mechanics are there and they are proceeding. On the treaty front, the, uh, I mentioned the uh, comprehensive land claims. In addition to those, those, there have been a series of negotiations of what's called specific claims which relate to past treaty breaches and those claims have also been proceeded with. The final legal development is the, uh, the resolution uh, of uh, group or collective claims arising from abuses. The Indian Residential School Settlement, uh, what is now the, uh, the day schools litigation, which is ongoing <coughs> in, in Canada. The whole question of uh, the uh, abuses in institutions under class action procedures these claims have been accepted and in, in the, most of the cases eventually government has agreed to negotiate. So there are settlements proceeding dealing with individual abuses. In terms of the suggestion of participation of native uh, Canadians in the governance system. Uh, we, have, we do not have a strong record. Uh, there is, uh, in, the, in, the, in the, we had a major royal commission. In the royal commission uh, on Aboriginal peoples, there was a proposal put forward for a third house of parliament uh, by one of the Aboriginal organizations. Uh, the Congress of Aboriginal peoples put that forward. Uh, it has not seen the light of day uh, since then. Uh, there has been, I, I, I think it's fair to say uh, that there has not been too much interest on the Aboriginal side in, in, a, uh, in having a, a third order of government or, a, or a, even a mechanism to guarantee uh, seats. Uh, there is uh, uh, an interest uh, that the politicians should give representation and lobbies are struck, but there is nothing in the law that requires, for example, a seat on the courts to be uh, held by an Aboriginal lawyer. Uh, that is, that, but there have been, uh, in our federal courts and in our provincial courts, there is representation, there are uh, lawyers who are, ab have a, Aboriginal background. And they are, they are uh, uh, there, but they are there as part of the overall process. There is no guarantee of participation. There's no guarantee of participation in Parliament. And uh, so that uh, there is no message there to the 
uh, the solution that is uh, was in the Uluru statement uh, as to a voice, a voice to Parliament. The the area that I was going to uh, complete my remarks on uh, it has to do with uh, the constitutional change. Um, our experience is it's extremely difficult and that it moves very, very slowly. There is not much I can say that uh, uh, would encourage Canadian politicians to argue today for amending the Constitution. Um, the, the fact that these amendments have to go to the population for approval through a referendum. Uh, we've had some experience with referendums in the province of Quebec. Uh, we, we are not uh, enthusiastic, I would say, as a people about that type of thing. Uh, it is often taken over by rhetoric, by positions that appeal to uh, the, the personal interests uh, where you have common political support, it may be another. It, it may be another question. But the message that has to be given to the electorate at large, it seems to me, must be simple and uncomplicated. And technical amendments uh, may have a rough go ahead. The second point I wanted to make in conclusion is that with respect to moving forward with Aboriginal rights, treaty rights, is only one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is anti-discrimination, is equity, is basic human fairness. There is a huge problem with the standard of living, particularly in remote Aboriginal communities, Health, clean water, basic, uh, uh, basic housing, it's all, all needs to be addressed. That social agenda has to be part of the process for constitutional reform as well. Thank you. And our final speaker uh, for this session before we break is Patrick Watase Madabi, Grand Council Chief of the Ashinaabek Nation. Thank you. <clears throat> Firstly, I also want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians and on whose traditional lands we meet, pay our respect to the elders of the, I'm going to say this wrong, I just know it, Ngoal people, past and present. In our tradition, uh, uh, this morning I was able to give some of the elders a, a bundle, uh, you know, respecting uh, the territory here and, uh, and having them as our hosts. So uh, I, I was fortunate I was able to meet some of the elders this morning and also participate in the smudging ceremony. We have a similar ceremony in our, in our uh, tradition. I gave my uh, introduction of introducing myself. My name is Widase. It's a name given to me by the uh, elders and the people from our treaty, the Lake Huron Treaty, which is a pre-Confederation treaty. And uh, it means warrior, but not so much in the sense of somebody that's going to battle, but somebody that looks after his people. It was the role that I played as Grand Council Chief, uh, and as a chief in my community, and, and many other uh, roles I played on behalf of our, our people for 46 years. I recently retired about three weeks ago, so uh, I'm trying to have a life again. Unfortunately, I've only had about three days off since uh, I retired. Um, anyway, uh, I talked about, uh, I come from a small First Nation called Ondek Omnikani. It means where the crows live. And it's important that I, I say that because under the federal government system, they used to call us Sucker Creek Indian Reserve because the Indian agents saw a creek where smelts and suckers came to uh, spawn, and they said, well, uh, you're Sucker Creek. Well, that name wasn't relevant to us. 
because we were on deck Omnikani. And we're from Manitou Minasing, means the island of the great spirit. And uh, we're very spiritual people, and I'm also from the, I'm from the Eagle clan. So uh, I want to start off by, uh, you know, indicating, you know, who I am. You know, uh, it's very difficult to condense uh, history in a very short period of time. And I'm going to try to go through uh, some things very quickly. And, uh, you know, just say that our relationships is very key to this whole discussion. And we've gone through four different types of relationships in our country with the newcomers. And I want to say that uh, history in our country didn't begin when Champlain came down the St. Lawrence River or, or other explorers came down the, the river systems and lake systems. You know, our, our people have been there since time immemorial. And, uh, you know, history, you know, uh, this is a saying, is his story. It's not our story. And part of the challenge, I think, for folks here is to start telling your story. And that's what we're doing as First Nations in Canada, is to start telling our story. So the first uh, relationship that we had was a nation-to-nation -nation relationship when, you know, the English came over and the French and various other explorers that came to our land. And that was even recognized and acknowledged by the Royal Proclamation of 1764, where, you know, there was an acknowledgement of the nations in our country. We have over 52 different distinct nations in our country with many different uh, language, uh, languages spoken. Where I come from in Ontario, there's three major language, or three major nations, the uh, Crees are in the north, the Schnabek are in central and part of southern Ontario, and then the uh, Mohawk and Iroquois Confederacy are, are in parts of southern Ontario as well. And uh, this Royal Proclamation talked about how uh, the king acknowledged the fact that uh, you know, uh, they were there to try to, uh, you know, do trade. You know, it was mentioned by Mr. Crane about the fur industry. And whoever uh, was allies with the uh, tribes of the area, you know, controlled the trade uh, and, and the fur market in the area. So that, that's why you saw, you know, uh, you know, some of the tribes were allied with the British and some were allied with the French. But whoever held the military balance of power, because our tri our our, our numbers are very significant, and I also mentioned you know, the American uh, attempt to come to Canada and take over in the War of 1812. And it was our warriors from our territories that battled back the Americans when the British fled the forts, and uh, we saved our country. So this nation-to-nation -nation relationship, uh, you know, uh, talked about how they were to treat, you know, the relationship with First Nations, and in some respects, and I don't know if this is a true or not, but I, I feel it, the word treat was kind of the origin of the word treaty, about how you would treat, you know, your, your, uh, your partner in a treaty relationship. And that nation-to-nation -nation relationship was, was there, and it was supposed to even be embodied when uh, Canada became a, 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 a confederation in 1867. Now, some argue that, you know, maybe even today Canada, you know, in terms of the nation criteria of who's a nation, uh, you know, could argue maybe that uh, it isn't a country, you know, because uh, they didn't have land. That land was indigenous land. Uh, they didn't have languages because that languages in that country was indigenous languages. They brought those languages over from France and England and other parts of the world. Their judicial system was brought over from Britain. You know, so uh, even the spirituality, we had spirituality in our territories long before the various churches came into our territory. So, you know, today, uh, you know, we look at that, that, that aspect of that nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And when Canada became a confederation, shortly thereafter, uh, I believe it was the date around 1876, they created this Indian Act, which uh, Mr. Crane re made reference to. And... Again, the original intent behind that uh, Indian Act was supposed to, uh, you know, contain some of the, uh, you know, uh, thoughts that went into the Royal Proclamation of how they would treat and work with our people. But unfortunately, you know, uh, it became an administrative relationship with our people. And this was used to uh, take control of us from cradle to grave. They controlled every aspect of our lives. 
and uh, it included even uh, telling us who, who we were, whether we were an Indian or not. And uh, that relationship uh, continued, and, and, and Mr. Crane uh, talked a lot about the chronology of our history, and I won't, I won't repeat it. And, you know, I'll fast forward to, the, you know, the, the 60s, like he talked about. And I think that was a critical period in our history because, uh, you know, in some respects, uh, maybe the government of the day did us a favor by really waking us up uh, when they tried to introduce the, the 69 white paper. And they were trying to assimilate our people. And we countered with a red paper that said, no way were we going to assimilate. And that was really, uh, although even there was earlier remnants of uh, organizations uh, established, uh, it really became a, a, you know, a catalyst for, for our, our people to mobilize. We started fighting back. And, and, and it was pointed out, you know, prior to that time, we couldn't even get legal advice. We couldn't leave the re reserve without, uh, uh, you know, getting permission from the Indian agent. If you became educated, you were deemed to be civilized and you lost your status as an Indian. Uh, if you went away to war and came back, you lost your status as an Indian. There was people removed from the treaty lists and many different ways of this legislation, the discrimination that he referred to, removed people from the status list. So this really became a catalyst, uh, uh, you know, to start fighting for our rights. And I'll fast forward to, again, he made reference to the constitutional discussions. There was ministerial meetings. Or, Crisscross in the country leading up to that, talking about what should be into this into this constitution, and uh, you know uh, the '69 uh, uh, white paper and, and and subsequent policy and legislation of the government tried to uh, uh, change us and uh, and and even create legislation called the First Nations Governance Act, which would municipalize our turn us into municipalities, and we said we didn't want that. And uh, this is where they were trying to change our relationship into a contractual relationship. You know, again, we went nation to nation, then we went to administrative, then contractual. So we fought back and tried to bring it full circle back to the nation to nation relationship with the constitutional discussions in, that took place in 1982. And that wasn't an easy discussion. Uh, we had to go, chiefs went to uh, Britain, lobbied launched court cases. There was a court case called the Lord Denning case that talked about the rights of, and responsibilities of the treaty process and uh, talked about the divisibility of the crown, right in round, the crown and right of England and now the crown and right of Canada and the crown and right of the provinces and their obligations to uh, uh, maintain the, the treaty relationship. And that still exists today. It hasn't gone away. And one of the things that we are really trying to teach people, at least in Ontario, is that we are all treaty people. They keep saying that you are treaty people, you First Nations are treaty people, but we are all treaty people because we had to have partners to sign the treaty. So they're treaty people too. And uh, so when we, uh, we signed this uh, uh, constitution in 1982 when the prime minister signed it, I remember that, that, that constitutional talk started out uh, kind of on, on a wrong note. Uh, prime Minister Just, uh, Pierre Trudeau said, Aboriginal treaty rights are a non-starter. That was the first thing practically out of his mouth when we started the discussion. I remember it well. I was there. I, uh, I, 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 I'm, I feel a little bit, uh, you know, uh, people have said I look younger than I turned 65 about, about a couple of months ago. And, uh, but I was around in uh, a lot of this modern uh, 69 white paper, the opposition to the First Nations Governance Act. Uh, during the constitutional talks, I was there during the Meech Lake, the Charlottetown Accord, uh, the Kelowna Accord, uh, and helped uh, uh, f form the Kelowna Accord because there was many, many attempts at trying to deal with our First Nations situation. Uh, and uh, former Prime Minister Paul Martin championed the Kelowna Accord where you know, we, we thought we had uh, a full comprehensive uh, uh, way of how we are going to have a relationship. And unfortunately, uh, an election occurred and the Conservative government killed the Kelowna Accord. And, uh, you know, so we've had lots of situations, and even the constitutional talks of in 1982 have not fulfilled what they were supposed to do. A year after the, uh, and I should point out that uh, we were, we had to fight to get Section 35 in the Constitution because originally it was Section 34, the reference to Aboriginal and Treaty people. But in order to try and appease René Levesque and the uh, Quebec separatism, 
There was a, a deal trying to be cut in the kitchen of the Chateau Laurier Hotel uh, before you get to the tunnel to go over to the Congress Center where the meeting was going on of trying to appease René Lévesque and some of the other provinces. They wanted to remove references to Aboriginal treaty rights. So we fought back and it came back as Section 35. And, uh, you know, uh, some of those moments in history are quite scary. Uh, I, I received a phone call. I can say this today because it's old history. But uh, I received a phone call. I was staying at the Chateau Laurier. Uh, some guys I, that worked in the mines in Inco in Sudbury saw that they removed the Section 34. And they said, Chief, what do you want us to do? We've been stealing dynamite out of Inco. We'll take out every bridge and railway system and pipeline between here and Sault Ste. Marie. I said, whoa, hold the phone. I said, <clears throat> we're still negotiating. <laughs> So it was, well, it's quite surprising that, you know, uh, hard rock miners were watching what was going on in the constitutional talks of our, of our country. Um, you know, uh, so uh, we fought back and it became Section 35, but within one year of the constitutional talks in 82, there was supposed to have been another constitutional forum uh, to discuss jurisdiction. What was federal jurisdiction, what was provincial jurisdiction, what was going to be First Nation jurisdiction, and where there may be areas of shared jurisdiction. And we were talking about an order of government back then. We weren't talking about a third order of government, we were talking about an order of government and how those relationships would, 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 would uh, work itself out by this discussion about jurisdiction and how, how we would work out those jurisdictional discussions. That has not happened even to this date, you know, do the math from 38, 40 years later. Uh, that still is a, an outstanding piece of business. And the fact that they're even dealing with us is still part of the outstanding business of the Lord Denning case and, and, and even the Royal Proclamation because, you know, uh, this, this should be noted. There were no other groups at the constitutional talks other than the federal government, the provincial government, and our, and our first, our indigenous peoples. There were no labor groups there, there were no church groups, there were no other interest groups there, minority groups, or anybody, because legally they still had unfinished business with the indigenous peoples in this land. And that's still an outstanding issue in our territories. You know, there's been lots of activity have happened uh, between uh, the constitutional talks, and now we've made some progress, and, and we've also uh, had some setbacks. Um, we went through a 10-year era of a conservative government that took us to court, 90-some uh, cases costing about $290 million, and they lost every case. You know, the truth shall set you free, they say. And, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, even the uh, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People was originally uh, rejected by Canada. And, you know, uh, we played a little bit of politics. We went to uh, the provincial legislature and said to one of the opposition parties. You know it would be a real feather in your hat if you uh, upstage the, uh, the, the, the government in power and, and introduce a bill recognizing the uh, UNDRIP. So uh, we went over then to the, the, the party in power and said, did you know what the opposition party is thinking of doing? They're thinking of uh, putting forth uh, uh, a, 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 a bill here to recognize UNDRIP. So the provincial government in power quickly passed UNDRIP. And then we said to the provincial government, you know, you'd be really, uh, it would be really embarrassing uh, if you were to pass this legislation before the federal government did. And then we went to the federal government and said, do you realize that the provincial government is talking about passing re uh, legislation to recognize UNDRIP and you haven't done it? And in the very next throne speech, uh, they recognized UNDRIP with some conditions, of course, that uh, they talk uh, about trying to water it down. So, you know, uh, uh, there's been lots of uh, activity have gone on. We've, we've entered into, you know, different discussions with the province as well, and they're, they're, they're part of this equation now, where at one time it was only a federal relationship. And uh, we've had uh, some milestones reached where we've created statements of political relationship of how we're trying to uh, work with each other. Um, and one of the things that we've said and, and, and advocated to both the federal and provincial government is nothing about us without us. 
So don't be discussing anything about us unless we're engaged. And they tried to do that recently with uh, health transformation as an example. And we quickly went to the minister and said, and to the prime minister that, you know, you can't be talking about health system delivery to our people without talking to us. So we're, the health transformation discussion is something that's going on right now. They've come out recently, uh, you know, with the election of the Liberal government about this whole uh, notion of reconciliation. And I've said to both level of governments, reconciliation is fine words. We need reconciliation action. I said, action speaks louder than words. And, you know, I think I've said to, uh, you know, we have this uh, uh, two-world wampum treaty as well that talks about how you know, the crown is in, one, is in their boat and we're in our canoe and we travel parallel together in, in, this, in our land and that we don't interfere, they don't interfere in our canoe, we don't interfere in their boat, but we work together in a relationship as, as the treaty has outlined. And one of, the, one of the ministers used to talk about, you know, how he uh, you know, wanted to, uh, you know, uh, honor that, uh, that relationship. And I said to him, I think you need to get into a speedboat because you're very slow in moving forth any action. And uh, so I think that's part of the problem is that, you know, there, there has to be, uh, uh, you know, a lot of work. Uh, and and they've, they've, they've come out recently with, uh, besides this reconciliation discussion, something called a, a new governance and fiscal uh, uh, relationship. And they've divided the uh, uh, what used to be Indian Affairs is now called the Department of Indigenous Services Canada. They've changed their name a couple of times. It used to be Aboriginal and Northern Affairs Canada. They were Indian Affairs Canada at one time. And, uh, you know, we keep saying to them, you know, um, that we're Anishinaabe. We're not Indian, you know. And even during the constitutional talks, uh, I, I should have made reference to that, we, we talked about how we would reference ourselves in the Constitution. Of course, the government didn't listen to us, but anyway, uh, uh, we said, you know, we're, 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 we're not Aboriginal, we're the original people. So it's like being normal and abnormal. We're original, we're not Aboriginal. And you can be native of anything. Uh, we said, we're not natives. And uh, indigenous was a term that is, you know, widely accepted, uh, you know, internationally. But then uh, an elder, a woman from Saskatchewan, Crees, said, the Canadian Constitution, uh, the preamble to the Canadian Constitution is, 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 a, is a lie. It says the founding nations of Canada are the English and French. She said, don't they know that we were the first nations in this land? And that's how the term first nations came to be used in Canada. And, you know, in my community, I quickly took down that Sucker Creek Indian Reserve sign and I put up on deck Omniconing, Ojibwe Territory. Uh, you know, because our identity is very important to who we are. So we're starting this whole discussion with the government now. And we're very concerned that, you know, we have to have political will. And I guess this is an advice to folks. And I'm not about to tell you how to do your business, but, you know, we're saying amongst ourselves, we have to be very careful that, you know, we, we talk about a political will and a political move to get consensus on how we're going to move forward in, 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 in the future. Not get tied up in legalistic uh, uh, parameters, because that's exactly what they do all the time, is box us with policy and legislation and legal, legalistic, you know, uh, constraints. And, uh, you know, we, we've termed some of the work that we've had to do with the federal and provincial government, and we call it proactive disengagement. Just keep us talking, but don't do anything. And it drags things out for years and years and years. And we're saying to them, we want pro pro pragmatic sovereignty. We can't leap from where we are over to total sovereignty. You know, we have to build capacity along the way. And, and we may never get to, uh, uh, you know, uh, full sovereignty because that may not be a desire of all nations across our country. Uh, we, we will continue to have a relationship, you know, with the, with the crown. You know, with the Anishinaabek Nation, we've, we've now started our own, uh, we, we, we passed our own constitution. It's called Chinook Nagalin, the Great Law, about, uh, I think it was in 2012. And we are getting individual communities to pass their own Chinook Nagalins. 
Uh, we are, uh, we've passed our own citizenship law called Eben uh, Dogjajik. It means those that belong. Because identity is very important because the government has systematically eliminated our people and are continuing to do, this, do so today with uh, uh, this Indian Act by having designations of who you can be uh, a, 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 a section. Uh, there's various categories and, and it lessens and lessens your, your rights. And we're saying we, we should know who, who, who belongs to our, our people. And this identity is very important. You know what the elder said to me? A moose is a moose, a duck is a duck, and a schnabe can only be an schnabe. You can't be anything else. So trying to assimilate us or trying to make us into something we're not will never happen. So, uh, you know, that's why it's so important that we're, we're, we're talking about our own citizenship laws. We're talking about our own child well-being law because much like the Maori have talked about, you know, we have more children in care now than even during the residential school area by a time period because of the 60s scoop. And, um, you know, uh, we, we are trying to get back uh, uh, to our own systems of government. We have a clan system, and we have uh, seven clans, and there's many clans behind that clans, but the main clans are, uh, you know, starting from the Eastern Door, the Washkesh clan, which is the Deer clan. And, it, you know, it has the responsibility for uh, uh, things like social services. We have the Megizia Eagle Clan, which is more like uh, your, um, your education people, the responsibility for education. Ajijak, the Crane Clan, you know, has responsibility for different things. The Turtle Clan uh, is uh, like a mediation responsibility. We have a, in the uh, Mong, the Loon Clan, is like your internal chief. Uh, internal relations and the the uh, the uh, external relations, and we have the bear clan, which is responsible for uh, uh, like health, and the Martin clan for uh, economic development. So we're getting back to our own uh, uh, forms of government. I just want to talk about uh, again uh, in trying to wrap up. Uh, you know, we also are saying we should be respecting diversity. And amongst us ourselves, though, you know, it's important that we maintain unity amongst our own selves of, if we're going to be strong to promote, you know, our rights in our own country. And, uh, and, 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 and also, it's important that we deal with the rights holders, the individual uh, uh, leaders of those treaties and those communities are the rights holders, not the provincial territorial organizations that represent them. And I say that as a leader, a former leader of a provincial territorial organization. It has always been my belief that the rights holders at the community level are the ones that the government needs to be talking to. So a lot of work to going on, uh, and I think uh, if we can avoid, uh, you know, the bureaucracy or the legal uh, legal beagles goofing things up uh, as much as possible, and uh, create some political will, we'll get some movement in Canada. Because, again. Uh, you know, uh, we've been around for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. I could say that a thousand times, and we're not going away. Miigwech. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, that concludes this session. We now have the um, Joint Select Committee on Constitutional Recognition hearing with Senator Patrick Dodson and Julian Lisa. Uh, who will be here, and that will be conducted in here. Everyone else can break lunch. Those of you who are not staying to be part of uh, to be part of that session, and we're back in at two o'clock.